Today, by singing together hymn number 218, it came upon a midnight clear, just the first verse for now. Today's poem is I Worried by Mary Oliver. You can be seated, by the way. Today's poem is I Worried by Mary Oliver. I worried a lot. Will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And if not, how shall I correct it? Was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Will I ever be able to sing? Even the sparrows can do it, and I am, well, hopeless. Is my eyesight fading, or am I just imagining it? Am I going to get rheumatism, lockjaw, dementia? Finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing and gave it up, and I took my old body and went out into the morning and sang. Could you stand for the call of worship, please? Sing aloud, O people, sing and shout. Set your feet firmly on the ground, open your mouth. Here is our song, a triumphant light against the long shadows. With joy we sing. We'll sing the third verse of Midnight Clear. Do you want them to stand up? Yeah, stand up.
You may be seated. Our first scripture reading today is from Luke, chapter 1, 46 through 55. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their most in, inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful. To Abraham and he, his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. You can stay seated for verse four. <laughs> Our children, any children who wish to come forward for our children's moment may do so. guys all ready for Christmas? No? You got some shopping to do still? <laughs> well, that's okay. You don't have to be ready for Christmas yet because we've got one more, two more candles to light. We're going to light the white one on Christmas Eve, but we're almost there, right? Almost time for Christmas. Yep, the purple and the white ones, the only two left. So, yeah, we're almost there. Are you excited? What are you? A new what? Minecraft. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah, Minecraft's fun, I've heard. So, we look forward to Christmas because we get presents, first of all. Not <laughs> but what's the real reason that we look forward to Christmas? Yeah, see families and friends, that's a good reason. And to celebrate the birth of Jesus, too, right? That's a good one. Yeah. So, and you can celebrate that with your family and friends, and that's the best way to do it, I think. Now, also, when we celebrate Advent, we're looking forward to Christmas, and we're looking forward to the presents and to Jesus' birth, but we're also looking forward to the time when Jesus is going to come back to earth and be with us forever. So, there's a man named John, and he had a dream about this. John was one of Jesus' helpers, 
and he was old now and living on an island. So here's his island. It might sound nice to live on an island, right? Yeah, it was a prison. He, the leaders put him there because he was talking about Jesus and they didn't like that. So I'm sure you don't think a little thing like being in a cell in a prison on an island in the middle of the ocean, yeah, that's his prison. Do you think that could stop God's plan though? Nope. So one morning, Jesus appeared right there in John's cell. Jesus' eyes were bright, shining like the sun, and he said, I'm going to show you a secret. Jesus said, when I come back, his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. He said, write down what you see so that God's children, which is all of us, can read this dream and be happy and excited and celebrate Advent. So Jesus gave John a beautiful dream, except that John was wide awake, and what he saw would one day all come true. So here's his dream. He wrote it down. He said, I see a throne. And on the throne, there is a king. There's the king. And the king is Jesus. And all around the throne, people are bowing down. They're giving him their treasures. There are loud cheers, clapping, clapping in bright laughter like a thousand waterfalls. And everyone bursts out singing a brand new song. Sounds like a party, doesn't it? Yeah. They shouted, this is our king our rescuer, all honor and glory forever. And every creature everywhere on heaven and earth joins in. Can you imagine that? Look, all the animals joined in too. My cat joining in. Your dogs would join in. So every creature everywhere. And then from all around, there was a wide, immense, beautiful silence. And Satan, God's horrible enemy, is thrown down and defeated. And then... He says, I saw a sparkling city shimmering in the sky and glittering and glowing from heaven. And from the sky, heaven's not staying up there. It's coming down to earth so that we can all enjoy it. God's city is beautiful and it's got jewels and gold. And where's the sun? Well, there is no sun because God is the light and they don't even need the sun anymore. And so that's the, the big party that everyone is looking forward to. And that's part of Advent, too, as we look forward to that day when heaven comes back down to earth and we can have a big party. So I've got my Advent stocking. And when I think of parties, I think of balloons. So I'm going to make y'all... Well, I already made them. I can only fit one in the stocking, though. So this can remind you of that party... And that will be a day when all God's people will be able to love each other and know the love of God and no one will ever feel sad. I can, but now I'm going to make a heart. So, who wants this red one? Want the red one? Yeah. I've also got, I've got a blue one. Blue one? I've got two blue ones. So, what color do you want, Frankie? I don't have any more blue. I got red and purple and pink. Red. All right. I've got more if any adults want some. <laughs> so take that home and remember that there's a big party coming and remember that God loves you. So let's, let's pray. Bef Not right now, but maybe later, all right? All right, let's pray real quick before I send you back to your seats. God, thank you for these kids, and thank you for their energy and how excited they are and how excited they make us all. Help them to have a good Christmas and to be patient as they wait these last two weeks. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Oh, it's like a hat. Now is the time when we celebrate our offering. We not only look forward to Christmas, but we look forward to the day when the kingdom of God will be here on earth. And that's happening in the future, but it has already started at the same time. And, and one of the reasons we give on our offering is to celebrate and be grateful for that. So we start the party now. So will our ushers come forward?
God, these gifts that we bring you today are only part of our offering. May we also offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving, singing songs pleasing to your ear. May the joy you have poured out in our lives overflow in our giving, our serving, in our loving, so that all the world may hear. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts for hearing of the word by singing together, Angels We Have Heard on High, verses 2 and 3. were playing which is beautiful so all right you may be seated and our second scripture reading for today comes from psalm 113 psalm 113 praise the lord you who serve the lord praise praise the lord's name Let the Lord's name be blessed from now until forever from now. From sunrise to sunset, let the Lord's name be praised. The Lord is high over all the nations. God's glory is higher than the skies. Who could possibly compare to the Lord our God? God rules from on high. He has come down even to see heaven and earth. God lifts up the poor from the dirt and raises the needy from the from the garbage pile to seat them with the leaders, with the leaders of his own people. God nests the once barren woman at home, now a joyful mother with children. Praise the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Now that may the words of my mouth be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. 
So we're continuing our Advent series, which I've called The Poets and the Prophets. And we've been talking about uh, modern poetry and how it relates to some of the poetry in the Bible. Most of our sermons so far have come from the prophetic books of the Bible. And this makes sense for a series on poets and prophets. A lot of the prophetic books in the Bible are mostly poetry. But we're going to move away from those books for today because where do you encounter poetry most frequently in your life? Now, some of us may sit down and read poetry from time to time. I know I do. But most of the poetry that I encounter on a day-to-day -day basis comes from music and song. And plenty of the poetry in the Bible was actually written and meant to be set to music. The traditional lectionary passage for this week is a passage that we Christians call the Magnificat, or the Song of Mary. We lit the, the pink candle today, which is, well, I'm wearing pink because it's my favorite color. It's the one day, there's two days of the year where pink is the main liturgical color, and so I get really excited. But anyway, we light the pink candle today, and it represents Mary, the mother of Jesus. And so... We talk about this song of Mary, and it's what uh, our liturgist read earlier. You probably know Mary's story, if you have had any time in church. Mary, she was an unwed young mother. She's living in the city of Nazareth, and she's visited by an angel. And the angel tells her that she is going to miraculously bear the Son of God. Mary, she's so excited, she runs to her cousin Elizabeth and finds out that her cousin Elizabeth is also miraculously pregnant with John the Baptist, who will announce the reign of Christ. So afterwards, after she finds this out, after all this good news, Mary bursts out into song. She sings her own song of Advent. And Linda read this earlier, but I'll read it to you one more time. It's from Luke chapter 1. Mary says, and she, it's Mary said, but she really sings, because this is poetry, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has helped his servant Israel. I won't read the whole thing, but... Those are some of the main points, and I, I read that, and I, it's one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible, because it's such a bold statement of faith, and I don't think we often talk about Mary as someone who has this bold faith. She's gentle, merry, meek, and mild, but here is this bold, brave statement of faith, especially if you understand the context that Mary is living in. She's a young peasant woman living in a very poor part of the area, Nazareth. And she's living in a land that is occupied by the Roman Empire. So her people, the Jewish people, they had once ruled themselves, they had once been a mighty nation, but now they are yet again, which seems to happen to them way too much, yet again they're under this brutal subjugation of the Roman Empire. But they were always waiting and hoping and trying to win their nation back. People took different approaches to this. Some were more peaceful than others. But people fought and planned. And they were often killed in, res in insurrections against Rome. And often people were killed just for getting a little too excited about God. So for Mary to sing a song like this is kind of risky. When she sings this song, when she says, my soul magnifies the Lord, she declares God instead of Caesar, the Lord of the Roman Empire. She declares God as Lord and not Caesar. She talks about God's strength scattering the proud. She talks about rulers being knocked off their thrones so that the humble, the everyday people can be lifted up. She talks about the riches of the powerful being given away to the poor. So we talk about Mary as if she was 
meek and mild, but I think she was far from it. I think this is some revolutionary language that could have gotten her in trouble if the wrong person heard it. And I read this, and I wonder where Mary got this from. What was her inspiration? What was her background? You see, Mary, as depicted here in Luke chapter 1, she really seems to be a woman who knows her Bible. The song she sings seems to have a lot of different sources from the Old Testament that she draws from. One of those sources, I believe, is our psalm for today, which I read, Psalm 113. So compare these verses. Psalm 113 says, He raises the poor from the dust, from the dust heap, and lifts the needy from the ashes to make them sit with princes and with the princes of his people. And then Mary's song says, He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. So there's some similar imagery being used there. Both are about this change in power. They're about a reversal of the status quo. They're about a belief that God cares for the poor and God sees when injustice is done to the poor. A belief that God is one day going to come into our unjust world and raise up the poor, raise up the hungry, raise up the needy from the dust and sit them on a throne and make things right. Both this song, both this psalm that we read and Mary's own psalm are about God setting our broken world right again someday. Another reason I believe that Mary's song was partially based on this psalm is verse 9 of Psalm 113. It says, he gives a barren, the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. So in our story in Luke, if you know the story, Luke just found out that her barren cousin Elizabeth is going to have a son. Elizabeth and her husband are very old, but they just learned that the same God who gave Abraham and Sarah a child in their old age is going to give Elizabeth and her husband a child as well. And as we said, that child will be John the Baptist, Jesus' Jesus's cousin, and, and John grows up to be one of those poet prophets who announces in the wilderness the coming of Jesus. We talked about his story a little bit last week. So Mary has just found out about Elizabeth, and she's just found out that she herself is going to have a son. And her pregnancy is also miraculous. Although Mary is a younger woman, she's about the age where most younger women were getting married, but she's not married, and she's never been with a man. Like the psalmist in Psalm 113, she is praising a God who does the impossible. Mary and the psalmist both sing about impossible things, like a virgin giving birth, or perhaps some even more, something even more unbelievable, a rich man giving away his share of the wealth so that the poor can be fed. These days, we have so much technology that a virgin birth doesn't seem entirely impossible anymore. But despite how far we've come with technologies that are supposed to make our lives easier, this gap between the rich and the poor just keeps getting bigger than ever, and technology only seems to make that worse sometimes. So whether we're talking about miraculous births or something that I think would be even more miraculous in our day, and that's that miraculous reversal of fortune, Whichever miracles we're talking about, Mary is a prophet. I think Mary is a prophet who speaks the impossible into existence. She's a prophet just like those Old Testament prophets who get all the credit. Mary is also a prophet who uses poetic imagery to paint us a picture of a world that has been set right by God. A world where God and not Caesar is Lord. A world that is similar to the world that so many of the Old Testament prophets spoke about. A few weeks ago, we read from Isaiah. He gave the same imagery of the world set right by God. He said, they will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. 
Mary is a prophet like Isaiah, painting these pictures of a glorious future where God returns to us. So Mary's a prophet. Uh, She's also a psalmist. She's a songwriter. She is a poet. She prayed the psalms so often in her own life that she knew these psalms inside out. These psalms taught her to pray and to sing and to praise God all on her own. Now, we've been talking about the Psalms in our Bible study, so everyone, gets to, everyone who comes to our Bible study gets to hear me be a nerd about the Psalms. Uh, there are many different kinds of Psalms. We've been uh, talking about there's a lament Psalm, and that's a Psalm where people cry out in desperation. The Psalms that say, how long, O Lord, will you let me suffer? And then there's songs about praise and thanksgiving and God's deliverance and and everything in between. There's a psalm for however you're feeling. Today's psalm and Mary's psalm that she writes, these are songs of praise and thanksgiving. They're really joyous and upbeat and optimistic, and they talk about all the good that God has done for us. But as we've been talking about in our Psalms Bible study, Every psalm of thanksgiving has a hint of a lament psalm in it. Every song of thanksgiving is not just a song of praise, but it's a reminder that God brought us through something. A careful reading of Psalm 113 gives you hints of what the psalmist must have been through. You read this and you think to yourself, well, the writer of the psalm must have spent some time in the dust heap. He must have, or she, maybe, knew some childless women. Maybe this song was even written by a formerly childless woman that God provided with a family. We really don't know because we don't get the whole story behind the lives of the people who wrote the Psalms, except maybe King David. Uh, But reading this psalm carefully, it's clear that whoever this psalmist was, life has not always gone perfectly for them but God brought them through. And when I read Psalm 113 and I start to think about Mary and her songs, I start to wonder, did Mary write other songs that didn't make it into our Bible? Did she write songs of lament, describing the events of her life and the life of her people that we later get hints of in Luke 1? Did she ever cry out to God in desperation, saying, God, hear the cries of your humble servant. How long, O Lord? We tend to think Mary just enters the story when the angel appears to her, but she's a woman who knows her Bible, so she must have been a woman of strong faith. I mean, think of the things that Mary would have seen from day to day, growing up where she did and living in the world where she did. Did she see the Roman officials making their way to their luxurious summer homes by the sea while her family went hungry? Did she cry out when she saw that, God, the powerful sit on their thrones while your people scourge for scraps in the dust? In Luke 1, she sings, He has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. And when I read that, I start to wonder what humble state she was singing about. Was it the poverty that her family was in? Was it maybe the blow to her reputation that undoubtedly came when she found out she was pregnant? It's not really clear, but we see hints in Luke 1 that God brought her through something. So I wonder if she ever wrote songs on the other side of that deliverance, songs of desperation, songs crying out for deliverance. I wonder what laments lie behind this song of praise. What circumstances did God deliver Mary from that allowed her to sing, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary lived in a very different world than us, but... Like Mary, we live in an Advent world. It's a world that is waiting for deliverance. A world where we've still got some candles left to light and we're still kind of in the dark. The poem we read earlier, which was by another poet, 
another poet named Mary, in fact, Mary Oliver. It says, I worried a lot. Will the gardens grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And if not, how shall I correct it? Do any of these lines stand out to you a little bit? For me, it's, how shall I correct it? Some days I feel, I don't know if you do, I feel personally responsible and personally burdened by all the pain and suffering in the world. And I feel like it's my job to make the earth turn as it was taught. And because I can't do that, it feels really powerless. And I read the words of Mary Oliver. She's one of my favorite poets. And then I read the words of Mary in the Bible. And I read the Psalms. And when I read those words, I know that the earth is not turning as it should. Our world is definitely not how God intended it. The mighty are still on their thrones. The poor still sit in the dust. And how can I correct it? There are things I can do. I can do my part, but that part is so small that sometimes it seems like nothing compared to how big the problems are. But Mary Oliver, in her poem, she comes to the realization that that worrying does not get her very far. She said, finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing and gave it up and took my old body and went out into the morning and sang. Mary, in the Bible, seems to have a similar solution. She doesn't lie back and do nothing. No, she does a lot. She gives birth to a savior. We all have our role to play. We all have our labor to do to bring God into this world. But when we start to feel overwhelmed, when we start to worry, when we start to feel this crushing weight on us, this weight of all the things we can't change, all the things we can't fix. Sometimes all we can do is sing. Sing because we know that God is the one who makes the world turn. Mary in the Bible, she didn't learn to sing and pray out of nowhere. She learned to sing and pray from the Psalms and she drew inspiration from them. So, like I've been telling my Bible study people, like Mary, the Psalms can teach us, I think, to sing and pray for ourselves. I've definitely had times in my life where I was so overwhelmed that I was like, I'm going to read the Psalms and read them as if they were prayers to God. And sometimes you come across those Psalms that are so angry and so frustrated and so sad and, and you just feel seen and heard. And then other times you come across those songs of praise and thanksgiving that let you just let go of your worries because you know that you're in God's hands. Sometimes you have those lament psalms that say, how long, O Lord? But other times you catch a glimpse of God's presence, a little piece of God with us in an unexpected place. And I think those psalms, those moments are a sign that even though we are waiting and waiting and waiting, God still can and will deliver us. And in those moments, all we can do is cry out, praise the Lord. Oh, servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. So I'm going to give you a challenge this week, as if you're not busy enough with Christmas. Uh, I'm going to challenge you to try reading and praying the Psalms. Maybe just one psalm a day. Maybe not even that. Maybe just one psalm for the whole week. I don't care. Do one. And don't just read it as if you're reading a book, but read it as if you are praying the words to God. It can be any psalm. I kind of believe that sometimes you just open to the psalm that you need, and sometimes the Spirit leads us to that. So pray one psalm this week, and let that psalm really sink into your bones and sink into your soul, because you may just find that these words come back to you in your time of need. Or in times of joy when you need help to praise and pray, just like Mary. Christmas is almost here. Advent is almost over. We're almost lighting all of the candles. We're almost there. But we still live in an Advent world. In this world, even after Christmas has come and gone, we will still be waiting and watching for Christ's return. And we need something to sing while we wait. And that something can be the Psalms. 
So let's pray together. God, thank you that you give us the songs that we need for every area of our lives. Thank you that you give us examples of bold leaders of faith, of prophets and poets who who paint pictures of the world that you have waiting for us. God, we all have our labor. We all have our job to do in this world. Help us to do that job well. And once we're done with that job, help us to let those worries melt away and let us sing. Amen.
Now is the time where we share our joys and concerns. And I also, if you have any announcements, I would go ahead and share those at this time too. Does anyone have the microphone? We don't have Ken here today. All right, you'll just have to talk loud. All right, anyone on this side of the room have prayer requests or announcements? Oh, there's the microphone. Okay, anyone on this row? Oh, we've got, yes. It's also for the online. And remind everybody that there is uh, an updated hotline, 988, that you can call or text. It's not this long number anymore. So yeah. whether it's you or somebody that you know who's struggling with stuff, it's almost 911. It's 988, but for suicide and crisis. It's not just a suicide line. So um, I just hate seeing people go that don't need to. That's really hard definitely be praying. All right. Anyone in this row? Yes. That's yes, here. I want to introduce Samson. Uh, my friend, he's uh, out on the road uh, fixing the uh, cables for this high tech for internet and everything. So he's from Oklahoma. So I want to introduce them. him. <laughs> Yes, I have a message from the lady that run the coats give out that we attended. Uh, she wants to thank everyone that was there that helped, which we had a very good turnout from the church. And also, I talked to the lady in Providence Place, and the two girls are coming to serve on Christmas Day. All right, anyone else in this section? All right, how about this section over here? Oh, did I miss someone? Um, I'm in charge of the Christmas dinner, and it's time to pump you people up. <laughs> yes. I realized last week I only have two more sundries. Ooh. So, the announcements are in your bulletin for work opportunities to help out. <clears throat> this is our 10th year, and it's going to be special. So, if you have the time or the inclination, the times are there. We do have a church service on Christmas morning, so you can run out over there and cook beans and ham. And then, if you'd like to work for the meal itself, come at 1.30. If you can't stay till 4, leave when you have to. You can come late and help clean up. Such a deal. We also serve desserts. I don't necessarily budget to buy enough pies for all our guests. So, you can start bringing pies the week of Christmas up till Christmas Eve, because we'll cut the pies Christmas morning, um, the health department really gets after me if I let you bring your own big pies. Okay. So please, store bought, pre baked. We don't have any oven room to bake anything that day. So we'd love to have your donations. It's your opportunity, if you can't help, to pitch in for this lovely deal that we got going to feed anyone who needs a meal. Thank you. Yeah. So that'll be a fun weekend. We've got Christmas Eve. What time do you all usually have Christmas Eve services? Six. All right, it'll be at 6 o'clock then. And then Chris, Christmas is on a Sunday, so Christmas morning. And I have always been told, if Christmas is on a Sunday, you get to come to church in your pajamas if you want. So <laughs> just throwing that out there. All right. Yes. Um, most of you guys know uh, my husband is in the bulletin. Um, He's serving time out in prison, but his grandpa just passed away, and his grandma, um, Georgia, is has had multiple strokes. Um, 
So it's already hard enough with yeah. him not being here and now with both of this, and I just need extra prayers for him. My daughter also put a prayer in for him as well. Right. Um, yeah, just, he's already in a bad place. <laughs> and then now knowing all this and he's not here to uh, yeah. to see his, his grandma or things like that. So um, just a little extra prayers, especially towards the holidays. Right. And what's his name again? Was it Sean. Paul? John. Sean. Sean. Okay. Yeah. Sean. Sean, definitely. Anyone else? I have one. Um, yes. There are no bells or choir this week, uh, but choir will be meeting at 9.30 next Sunday to sing our anthem. We're doing Tiny King. So. All right. So no bells or choir, but church or I want to thank Jerry for getting me over there to give those coats to people, to the, the, the kids. I didn't stay very long because I had to go teach, but it was a really good experience. The one kid I saw get a coat, and he was just like, his face lit up. You know, so thank you, Jerry, for doing that. I also want to tell you that Voices of the River on Friday night had an excellent performance. We sang to a sold-out crowd. It was just really wonderful to see the community come back together again. Next year, you guys should be there, too. That reminds me of another announcement. I promised the pastor at the Lutheran Church in town. Uh, they are having their annual Christmas cantata, which I heard is amazing. So they're having two performances, one on December 16th at 7, that's a Friday, and one on the 18th, which is Sunday, next Sunday at 3 p.m. So if you need those times again, just catch me afterwards. I saved them in my phone because I knew I'd forget. So. Come out to that. All right. Anyone else out there? I've got some to read, too. All right. I have a few to read. Uh, again, for Sean Richards, pray that he will be back home soon, and especially with everything going on that we heard about. For Kylie Williams, who is on life support, 15 years old, has pneumonia and sepsis. Her system is shutting down, and she's on a ventilator. And this is Lil Bodewin's prayer request. So let's pray for Kylie for sure and pray for Lil and the whole family who is watching this and struggling, I'm sure. We also want to pray for Carly Anderson, uh, Lil's great niece, who has had depression, has been suicidal, and tried to commit suicide this week, but family was able to stop her. She's a mother of five. And it sounds like this is just a rough year for people and a rough season, especially around Christmas. So pray for those families who are affected by it. And again, I want to lift up 988 is the new suicide hotline number. So if you know anyone who's struggling, keep that in mind. All right. Anyone else that I missed? Then let's go ahead and pray together. We pray to you, Emmanuel, God with us. We praise you in the silence and the singing and the waiting of this season of Advent. Because of you, stars shine in our lives and our poor manger places become holy straw. May the tidings of peace on earth and goodwill to all people of the earth always be on our lips as with the shepherds and the angels. We give you thanks, God, for becoming human. Why would you want to become human when we have so many of these struggles in the world? Why would you want to become weak and poor and lonely and sad? God, we, we struggle. Being human is hard. We want to pray for the family of Bethany. We want to pray for Sean and his family, especially his uh, grandmother, Georgia, who has had multiple strokes, and, and the family of this, his grandfather that they've lost. We want to pray for Carly Anderson, and for Kylie Williams. God, we want to lift up all these people in prayer because it is hard to be a person on this earth. You know that more than anyone. And we give you thanks that you came down to us, lifted us up, loved on the rejected and the broken, and allowed us to find hope and mercy in the rough places of our lives, in the valley of the shadow of death. Even there, 
we find reasons to praise you. And we want to praise you today for this uh, handing out the coats, that that went so well and we had such a great church turnout, and for the Providence Place. We want to thank you for all of the exciting things coming up for Christmas, especially our Christmas dinner. And we want to thank you for everything you do with this church. All praise to you, God, for your Advent candle burns brightly in our lives. And we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, we'll sing our last song, and as you sing today, remember those announcements that we have, and as the light of our candles goes out into the world, take that light and these announcements that we've just read, the Christmas dinner, all of this is an opportunity for you to bring that light into the world. So let's sing our last hymn, Joy to the World, hymn number 246. unto the Lord a new song. May God's song of joy be ever on your lips this Advent season. Go in peace. <laughs>